Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm talking to Sir Julian Rose, who was a pioneer of UK organic farming, commencing the conversion of his own farm in 1975. He sat on the board of the Soil Association in 1984 and campaigned vigorously for the widespread introduction of organic farming at a time when it was pretty much unknown. Now, mm. Sir Julian uh, achieved notoriety, it says here, when he brought a cow up to London at the Hyde Park Festival of Farming and he demonstrated fessorously against a government attempting to ban unpasteurised milk. In other words, keeping raw milk available to people. Sir Julian, it's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to participate. You must tell us uh, a little uh, about the story of bringing a cow up to London, which I suppose Londoners haven't seen cows in the city for a long time. So <laughs> it must <laughs> have been quite a, quite a surprise. Well, actually, this, is, this was a huge festival in Hyde Park when there were a lot of cows. <laughs> uh, oh, right. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, however, I, what I did was I, I took one of our cows to go and see cows and I draped a big banner over it saying save my milk because you know what comes out of a cow is raw unpasteurized real milk yes and uh, I had already achieved a lot of publicity in my defense of real milk because I formed an organization called the campaign for real milk association of unpasteurized milk producers and consumers the long title and um, it and ran this campaign in 1989, February of 1989, when the government decided it was going to ban on pasteurized milk. We won't go into the reasons why, but they've been trying to do this on and off for years. Uh, and what happened was um, I run a milk round at that time from my farm. And I discovered that one of the people on that milk round was the lead presenter of independent television news. And he said, I've heard about this, Sir Julian, what you're doing, and I, we could get the team up to your farm if you'd like to. I said, oh, yes, come on. Yes. And it happened to be a, a Sunday, and so I had to set up a sort of mock milk run, and I got my customers to come out with a wine glass full of real milk in front of the ITV cameras, and uh, it hit the headlines of the news, and then I got the BBC to do exactly the same thing. It, so successful was this. Uh, I was on breakfast television and goodness knows what else for the next few weeks that after three months we'd won. Oh. <laughs> and, and it involved Mrs. Thatcher even. Gosh. In saying I have some sympathy for your views about saving small rural businesses, entrepreneurial business in the countryside. But the, but the coup de grace in all this was that it turned out that the Queen only drank unpasteurised milk. Well... That's interesting. So the Daily Sunday Telegraph carried a huge headline, Queen's Royal Pinter to be banned. <laughs> yes. And who's, so we who's, had a lot of fun and we won. And you won. <laughs> and that's the main thing. And that sort of eats into the, into, or is the ethos of what your whole farming thing is, that it's a small farming. It certainly um, is. Yes. So you're, you're, you set up the Hardwick Alliance for Real Ecology. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, I'm co-founder with Justin Walker uh, of the Hardwick Alliance for Real Ecology. And this, this has existed, it was born in February 2020 on my farm on the Hardwick and Hardwick Estate in South Oxfordshire, with the task of creating a united front to expose, challenge and reverse our deeply oppressive, corrupted and degraded political and economic systems. So it's got a very wide remit. We're really tackling head on the major problems of society with hair. Um, as more and more people are realizing, our country's hard fought for freedoms are now under threat. Absolutely. Like never before. As a largely globalist agenda is leading us into a technology-based, totalitarian and centralized society, completely at odds with the values of human scale ecology, which is the true green vision, working with, not against nature. So um, to achieve this has committed to trying to develop a fresh socioeconomic model, one that's based on holistic, humanitarian and just practices, 
for the overall benefit of humanity as a whole. Um, what we want to try and do is, is promote a widespread adoption of human scale, pro-ecological and localized agriculture, localized renewable energy generation, along with supporting deliberately suppressed free energy technologies, which do exist. And we will be going on then for a radically reformed monetary system centered around harnessing a nation's natural wealth and creativity, thereby removing the need for invasive taxation and destructive debt via borrowing at interest from a totally private centralized banking system. And most people really don't recognize that our banking system is, to is private. Mm. Now, it is not government run or observed. It is totally it's in the hands of completely private uh, people and it's global and it has a massively powerful part in the way the world is run today. And then um, finally, we will go for the full restoration of common law justice. Common law justice, which guards the vital socioeconomic, humanitarian and even spiritual values of society. Um, it underpins universal justice, if you like, for a vibrant health and real happiness of all living beings. So actually, you see how, how universally broad as operation is, and our attempt is really to set the agenda for a new society and draw people together who feel similarly that we must make root and branch reform now. Yes. It's not a question of just tinkering with the existing status quo and trying to improve here and that. It's a question of totally rebuilding from scratch, getting back to the most fundamental issues. And essentially, there's nothing more fundamental than food. So Absolutely. ecology has a major issue to play for all of us um, in kick-starting a new way of life, a new lifestyle for us all, I guess. It's interesting you, you mentioned that. I was talking to somebody yesterday about uh, food and the importance of food and, f and getting people back into th the land, just, just experiencing it and understanding where our food comes from rather than the huge industrialization of it and, and, and this more sort of global um, control that seems to be, with the use of things like mainstream media and industry, pushing... Yeah less healthy food but as if it is healthy with yes. claims of this that and the other and yet you know basic ingredients that people were farming a hundred plus years ago did yeah. without any uh, uh, assistance of the globalists if you like telling them how, <laughs> well how, how to do things that's exactly that well what's happened i think richard and then um, is that people have basically become separated from source of nature, actually. Yes. And of course, food, because it's all one thing, essentially. That. They've been captivated by the convenience of buying their food from vast solar supermarkets and hypermarkets, whose mass produced products have depleted nutritional values, are over packaged, and have virtually no indication of place or origin or method of growing. So, you know, no. we've become completely alienated from what you just described. Well, once upon a time, we went out of our, the door of our homes and we picked from our own garden some of our most basic vegetables and, and fruits and products that we would have used for our dinners. Mm. And now that's considered a sort of um, modern lifestyle concept. You know, it's become something that you might say is... A fashion. Yes. Whereas it was based on necessity before. I remember as a kid going out with my parents blackberry picking, you know, from yes. the hedgerows. You just and everyone did it. It was it was everyone a thing. Did it. Exactly. Yeah. And now, you know, if you see somebody doing that, you think you know, you look at them and, and, and of course I I respect exactly what you're doing, but other people you see them looking at them as if they're scrounging <laughs> and going, Oh, can you not go to the supermarket and get them? They'll already be washed and cleaned and in a little ah, you yes. know, all of that. All of that. They've been through quality control. Yes. What you're eating might be something very dangerous and dodgy. It's yes, quite. I uh, know this is it's incredible. In the course of my lifetime, I can, I can hardly believe the changes. Yes. So 
um, we've got this situation where people are just totally dependent now on this sort of convenience way of life. And it doesn't give them an opportunity to challenge or think about the source of their food. In fact, the difficulties are that um, the products which are available en masse are coming from sweatshop wage production in largely the southern hemisphere and third world. Um, they've got very long food miles. And we did, we did a project many years ago with the Soil Association called Food Miles. And even then, that was about 20, more than 20 years ago, we discovered that the average distance traveled by food that occupies a typical trolley of supermarket food was over 8,000 kilometers. And that, and now it's even more, Yes, you know. Uh, and now organic food, which you're buying, has an even higher uh, global footprint. And it's coming from all over the world. And, and this is a, it's a very, very sad thing because the Soil Association was established um, by Lady Eve Balfour, a very remarkable soil scientist, it's expressly to promote local, fresh, wholesome food, which has not been sprayed by pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, has not been grown using nit synthetic nitrate fertilizer, but it has been grown using farmyard manures and all the rotational systems that you and I experienced till when we were children. Mm. So we've had a total reverse. Now we have a, a bio, used to be a biodiversity pyramid that was still expanding globally. But as of the last 40 years, it's been slowly, not so slowly even, shrinking. So the biodiversity of nature itself, and certainly the biodiversity of the food supply, shrunk right down. I think I'm right in quoting that there are only 10 products which form 90% of all vegetable products in supermarket. There are only 10, like cabbages, carrots, onion, cucumber, you know. It's absolutely amazing. And there used to be a diversity of two or 300 different yes. varieties of foods. That's what happens when one centralized global organization tries to take control of the food chain. And where we are now, uh, <clears throat> where we are now is that the World Economic Forum under Klaus Schwab, I the name people might become familiar with now. Yes. Yes, unfortunately, has um, set up a system which is going to try and create a robotic form of farming, a completely robotic form of farming. And the synthetic production of vegetables, synthetic petri dish products, yes. which you take genetic material on a pincer and you put it into a petri dish and you add chemicals and you start growing something which is a lookalike of real food. And then the diet, which we're supposed to um, live on after that, is going to be based on you know, laboratory food as opposed to real food. Mm. And a lot of people have heard recently about the fact that the insects are supposed to form a very high percentage of the food that we eat. So, you know, it's the most extreme situation you could possibly imagine. And unfortunately, the farmer, and this is very serious stuff, and it's all been written in Klaus Schwab's book, The Great Reset, and it's part of what's called the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal is essentially the most ungreen and the least new deal you'll probably ever come across, mm. because it's an inversion of the truth. It's sort of demonic, and actually, but it's reversing everything that's, that's beautiful and positive and nutritious and making it into the opposite. And then saying, look, the world has to be saved from global warming. Yes. And animals and farm animals and, and farming is contributing in a big way to CO2 and methane. And therefore we have to get rid of farms. We have to get rid of farm animals. We have to get rid of farmers actually and replace them with robots and make food a product which doesn't cause global warming. Zero carbon by 2050 is yes. the end of the, that particularly horrific word, along with something called being uh, transhumanism, which is the time when a, a human being is supposedly uh, linked up with a supercomputer and you don't even have to do your own thinking for yourself. You, you will have a computer do your thinking for you. And no, this is all real. This is point. Yes. I'm quoting factual information. Yes. And it's, I mean, it's, it's been planned, it seems, for a long time because there's been this slow um, 
dumbing down in a way of the of ordinary people who've accepted this so you go into a supermarket and you see a huge range of products and think you're actually having a choice you're but of right. course the choice is not the choice of as you say of different varieties of potato at different seasons of the year uh-huh. or different you know different flavors it's this one thing so that in the end you just don't you you you're being duped and of course well, as you say yeah. Yeah, and the biggest dupe, of course, is the global warming excuse. What you are seeing there is um, 20 different varieties coming from one corporation, and they make it all look as though it's different, you know. Yes. And the the thing about the supermarket is it's brilliantly psychologically thought through, and, of course, it comes from America. All this stuff, everything which is too big, and everything's based on only visual recognition, you know, it visually looks nice. Mm. That idea came from America, and it's to do with hygiene, and it's to do with, you know, being having access, convenient access. The actual issue of quality and nutritional value of food and all the rest of it isn't even in part of the picture in no. America. So, you know, we've inherited all that stuff for the last 40 years, and it's, it's had an enormous price to pay for doing that. So now, yes, we have to ask people, please change your shopping habits. Now you've heard that local farmers are uh, under serious pressure of being taken off the land in favor of the Green New Deal. We must support them and we must go to our local farm shops and try and support our local pro-ecological farmers. And there are quite a few. You have to seek them out. You have to yes. look for them. Yes. And you have to make a bit of an effort. And, you know, that seems to be too much to ask for quite a lot of people today, unfortunately. But uh, they... The, the farmer, the real farmer, will become wholly dependent on the consumer, I think, very soon. If you want to be an independent producer of food, you're going to have to have a one-to-one relationship with the consumer. And that is going to become a very interesting relationship because the consumer is going to relearn what real food is. And the farmer is going to have a proper rapport, finally, again, with the person he sells to. And, po- and actually, the proper price for the food yes. with no middleman. You know, no vast corporation controlling everything you do. So that's really the task I think that we all have in relation to food. We've got to get out there and support our small farmers before they're wiped out. I read a book by Graham Harvey, um, who was an advisor on The Archers, the BBC radio programme, yes. longest running soap opera. Um, but he, he produced a book, I think, in the late 80s or 90s called We Want Real Food. Mm. And he outlined exactly what had been happening over the last 70 years about how the monoculture had come in, how hedgerows had been removed so that bigger equipment could come into farms, how the old system of mixed farming had become uh, extinct effectively and how uh, the agricultural industry had provided every opportunity with chemicals and pesticides, just as you described. And he said one of the, so he he outlined all of that and he said, well, what can we do about it? And it's exactly just as you said there, Julian, about we need to change our habits. But he, his point was the supermarkets are there to make money. So if people go and say, well, I won't buy this, but could I have more organic stuff locally? And if people en masse were doing that, the supermarkets want to make money. So perhaps because they've got big car parks and people are used to going them, if you could persuade the supermarkets to buy locally from more local farms so that they weren't necessarily using the the power of um, of, of buying huge stocks from one place, but each each area could buy from all the more, you know, local farms, that could help. And it might then encourage more local farms, smaller scale farms, to be able to produce for an outlet. Well, no, that's, a, that's, that's a view I'm familiar with. In fact, I know Graham Harvey. Uh, he's a colleague. And I'm interested in reconsidering that. Actually, I dismissed it largely because of my own experience. I did try and sell to my local supermarket when I was running my, my farm, particularly in the 1990s. Right. And they were interested and they wanted to buy strawberries. I, I have a, a producer. A, on my farm who's a, who's a tenant now who produces organic strawberries and the man at the supermarket said okay 
yeah, bring them down, you know, we'll do it. And I did. And then the following week, when I came down with another lot, he said, oh, I'm very sorry, but I've been told we can't do this. We're not, we, we're not, we have to go through very strict quality control measures, which we, we can't do at the local level. It can only be done going through centralized control in Birmingham, mm. you know, and um, so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Well, in theory, if there was enough pressure and enough consumers and enough demand for buying local, they would have to capitulate to that. And yeah. they would have to redress their view that only money is the key issue, that there is something to do with serving your locality, which is, of a val is valuable. And if yes. we want to survive, we're going to have to think about how we can be more open to local people who want local real food. And the only problem is, as far as I can see, when you've got a very large establishment, very large buildings and huge expenses involved and very large staff, I think what we'd have to do is you'd have to cut it down to about one quarter of that space, mm. at least one quarter, possibly one sixteenth, and then have one very intensive small section, which is dealing entirely with the local food and paying people a fair price for it and being very honest about the, the form of production because the scale is too big. You know, there is something organic about the issue of scale. We're very keen on the expression human scale in relation to our relationship with, with, with food and farming and relationship to nature, a relationship actually with having a warm and community orientated approach to each other. When you feel you're in control of your own destiny, you have to have some knowledge of your own about your energy systems, you know. You have to have some knowledge how to grow food. You have to have some knowledge how to access clean water. You have to have some knowledge about building. You have to have some knowledge about these issues, which are called artisan issues, you know. And you have to see that beyond a certain point, that needs to remain small and medium-sized scale. If you get too big, it mm. starts losing its humanitarian level, its warmth. It's connectivity, it's yes. sense of community, and it becomes business, you see. Mm. It slips into this even un unintentionally, I think, in some cases. How many businesses do you know, you know that started in villages and small towns and were very, very you know, pleasurable to do? It might be their car mechanics or small yes. shops of various sorts, and grew one or two of them into vast things, which have then you, your relationship somewhere. changes doesn't it your relationship you become just a number instead yes. of a a valued yes. customer and all that thing that people yes. uh, in the past would say but i've been uh, with your company and i've taken your product for years you know surely that it counts for something and these days loyalty in these large companies means nothing and that's you know no. to an individual that's that's painful to accept. And you go, well, hang a minute. I've, well, I've been there when you were smaller and now you're big and you're basically kicking me in the teeth. So I'm going to take my business somewhere yes, else. <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, you've raised a point which reminds me about um, dairy farming. And I was, my main um, unit at Hardwick was the dairy farm. It wasn't ever big. We had about 40 cows eventually. I was milking cows and I was delivering the milk. I was the only um, titled milkman in England you know, at the time, <laughs> delivering the daily pint on people's doorstep. How, how yeah. wonderful is that? It's so Julian. <laughs> I really got a kick out of it. Yes, I, I don't know what other people saw. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I can give you a very interesting example of just what you said. I had. When I had 12 cows, every one of them had names. Mm. Millie, Bugle, Valley, Snowdrop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I had 20, I still managed to keep individual names largely, but I was beginning to get a bit vague about one or two of them. Mm. By the time I got to 30, I was on the edge of thinking it's going to have to change to numbers. And by the time I got to 50, I dropped names and they became numbers. You see? Yes. You see? And I'm very aware and concerned about this. 
On the farm, another issue is every field has a name. Yes. All our fields have names. You know, it's beautiful, actually. It's a long tradition in England. We have hedgerows and we have every field has a name. But these days, when you look at very large uh, um, global type mass produced farming enterprises, they only have numbers on fields. Yes. So you see, everything comes down in the end to this very scary sort of, and there is a, there is a real truth to the fact that the virtual reality world of the internet of mobile phones of a sort of virtual shopping and everything going more and more virtual is pulling people away from their most basic connection with the, with the soil and with nature mm. and putting them in a very dangerous state because from there you can be manipulated very very easily and politically manipulated particularly and of course that's what you know, the World Health Organization and the uh, United Nations and the World Economic Forum are basically doing. They're saying, we are going to run things and yes. you simply have to obey us. We're the only people that know what's needed to stop global warming. Yes. Zero carbon. Well, incidentally, zero carbon means no CO2. A CO2 is carbon dioxide, and that's what plants take in and give off oxygen. So with no carbon dioxide, we would have no oxygen to breathe. No. And yet the plan under the WEF is called net zero by 2050. That's what it's called. Yes. Net, <clears throat> net zero by 2050. It doesn't mean anything net zero anyway. So they're changing language to confuse us as well. Where that I got running on that rather because what we were talking about was scale and numbers and people who once used to be human beings suddenly coming across as being you know, yes. no, almost uh, automaton. But it's absolutely true, this whole thing that you've become so um, unconnected with with one of the most important things, which is food, and the the health benefits of good quality food. We're seeing yes. children with all sorts of problems. In fact, I, I was sitting outside my house and somebody went past and he said, oh, you're that Richard on the internet. And I said, oh, <laughs> very nice of you to recognize me. He said, oh, it's, um, it's all right. I, um, and he said he was stumbling, but he says, oh, I, I'm on the spectrum, you know. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And he said, well, everybody's on the spectrum these days, aren't they? Never used to be. And I, th I thought about that and I thought, well, maybe that's because we're all eating all these toxins and poisons and things that it's affecting us in, in very different ways. Whereas, you know, kids didn't have as many different problems than they used to do before they became yeah. immobile, sat in front of screens, uh, were eating yeah. convenience foods, unprocessed foods. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel that the health of the nation is, is plummeting down because we're not in yes. the countryside or uh, seeing and respecting. I mean, the other thing is respect for the food. That's, that's something which really yes, worries me. It. You know, yes. people just go, they've, they've gone to the pub, they're staggering home, they go to a, a takeaway and they're, mm. they're half eating a burger or something. An animal died and gave us, the, in theory, the nutrients and the goodness of their body. And sometimes you just see them just discarded there and that whole you know you, that life has has been brought up in these days in such an, a horrible industrial way oh. with no respect and dies to be you know a sort of a food that's that nobody knows about really or has any any respect for it and that's what i find you know particularly uh, it, it, uncomfortable it's frightening. No, you've, you've articulated it very well it's it's frightening it's inhuman and as i said again i have to come back to repeating this is part of a plan unfortunately it's not happening by chance although let's be honest people are very lazy people are as i said at the beginning people are far too trapped by convenience people aren't using their brains they're not using their hearts even. Mm. they're not really connecting their hearts and their minds even you know, they're losing control over their basic values of life, which you've extremely accurately articulated in that example, the discarding of food. Well, the waste, if you read the statistics, and it's talking about supermarket, but that's where most people shop, 
up to 60% of food is thrown out in the UK. Yes. Can you believe that? Well, and, and yet people are still using politics. food banks, you know, and yet 60%, yes. as you say, yes. is being thrown away. And yet, you know, there's, there's ridiculously, there's a need for food banks. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. It, it's absolutely extraordinary. So I think, you know, what we're really seeing is now that a real need to rethink through, um, to replan and to get heart and soul behind a whole nother approach to the future. Because if we're, our children and our grandchildren are growing up in a world which is human loving and caring with, with quality products available at reasonable prices and all the rest of it, it's us that's going to make it happen. We cannot sit back and expect anyone else to take control over that. The, 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 the demons are on the loose now mm. and we're going to be in a dark period for a long time. We ha only we can raise the light in our own selves and join together with each other to pull off this this huge change, which is a very, very exciting one. I mean, you could never have an ultimately a more exciting challenge than creating a new society almost from scratch. Yes. But building on the best of the past, quite often, you rightly pointed out, building on what you know was good and right and fair, and going on from there into a creative and imaginative free world where we become truly human again and we defeat the dark forces that are trying to make us totally inhuman. Yes, no, I totally agree. The, your screen is, is shrinking and, and going is because the connection is um, just a, a, a little bit shaky at that point. So apologies yeah. for that's not actually me shrinking. Maybe you're shrinking this. my head around, getting excited. I'll, I'll try yeah. to sit still. So, <laughs> so what can people take away from this? We can see that, that, that um, there is this problem that the globalists, if you like, have taken and and guided us down this course, which is clearly not good for humanity. We we in the past, we had some wonderful things. We didn't have all the wonders of technology back then. And yet for tens of thousands of years, we've managed to survive. And, and here we are. And yet here we're in this state where, in theory, we're more civilized and sophisticated. And yet we're actually in in many ways spiritually and uh physically in a in a worse state what 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 do people because people always say to me uh, you know it's all very well talking about it what can we practically do and this is the thing i mean for example i i i take I, i've got a supermarket right at the back of my house and wow. i so it's so easy it's so convenient just to wander over there and wow. but now I'm getting veg boxes from organic mm. veg supplier yeah. Uh, yeah. because as soon as you do that, you taste. Firstly, you taste the difference, and you yes, go, yeah. "Oh my God, that you know that is so much nicer yeah. than what is packaged mm. over there." And mm. you, you know, so that's one way that people can sort of say, "Hey, actually, I'm putting my money." Okay, it's a bit more expensive, but we're we're mostly overeating anyway. So we can yes, we value the, the, the quality and the taste and know that it's yes. actually doing us better and might yes. actually mean we don't need all those pills that we're often taking as, as supplements yes. or what the doctor says, you know, have some more statins to keep you going. I'm not, I'm yes. not saying get off your tablets, anybody, <laughs> without advice. But, um, mm. but healthy food mm. brings you know, a healthy mind, a healthy body, a healthy outlook, positive, yeah. positivity. Yes. Well, that's exactly it. You, you, you've, you don't, you've saved me a job. Oh, it. right, there Done we go. <laughs> 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 but well, basically, yes. I would only add to that that... Um, uh, Farmers markets ways, and things, and yes, getting... One of, sorry. One of the ways is, is to try and grow something yourself. I always say to people, particularly urban viewers, mm. create a window box. It just create a window box in your sitting room, your bedroom, or kitchen, wherever it is. Get some soil, could be composted soil, you can buy it, or you can just get some soil from a molehill somewhere, or you can, whatever. Take some seeds, mustard and cress, or some lettuce, or some radish, whatever it is. Plant them, and then remember to water those seeds every evening, uh, don't have too hot a room because they'll grow too fast. So keep your temperature down a little bit. And then 
wait for that exciting day when you see that little green sprout emerging like this. Yes. And uh, then keep your watering going and then make a little plan on a piece of paper about how you could make a small garden, let's say two by two square meters or three by three or smaller, one square meter in part of your garden if you have a garden. And most people have some sort of something of a garden. And then plant one or two more products. And then watch and learn how to nurture them, how to fertilize them, how to encourage them. And, how, and then eventually harvest them and eat them with great reverence, with great reverence. You yourself have become a gardener. You know? You've become a farmer. You understand what it actually means to grow the food yourself. And you will find, you will rebuild your connection with nature and the earth and the soil, and you will feel much more grounded as a person. And you will be able to look at your mobile phone, your iPod, you know, all these different gadgets, this virtual reality, EMF world, particularly the dangers of what's coming called 5G. But 4G is, believe me, bad enough. Mm. Uh, the EMF, electromagnetic frequencies, are damaging people terribly. And children should never be allowed to spend long time sitting with mobile phones playing these horror horrific games, actually, most of which are very aggressive. So parents have to take a controlling influence over their children, not let them do this if they want them to live without brain damage. They, what should they do? Come on, let's grow some seeds. In a, in a box on the window. Let's create a little garden outside. Let's watch those plants grow. Let's water them. Let's fertilize them. Let's do all that. And then I think people will find that life starts to mean, have meaning again, mm. real meaning. And you're starting to take control of your destiny. We have to take control of our destinies again. We simply cannot rely on other people telling us because they're cheating us. The great majority are cheating us and they're getting away with it and we're mm. letting them get it. It's a scandal. So I would only add that, uh, Richard. And um, personally, I, I, I feel, particularly for people in urban uh, settings, this is a great way to have the experience of what yes. it really means grow and to eat your own food. Start very small, everything starts small. Well, I think that's absolutely brilliant advice. Uh, particularly as I read this morning um, that allegedly rationing, food rationing is likely to be coming down. Apparently some scientists are saying, well, you know, food rationing. And I'm assuming that there is, don't worry, the WEF are going to be helping you out with synthetic food. And that's the most dangerous way to go. And I think if you can grow your own stuff, no matter how small and get bitten by the bug and realize absolutely take responsibility for our lives again and pull it pull our pull our socks up as it were and and feel that we have a role you know that's just going to role. and from there you know you start small but it'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow because people aren't waking up you know that's yes. the, that's the other yes. good news because of the extent of the horror the extent of the confusion that the sense of nervousness mm. we are all feeling because of the horrors going on on the planet everywhere you look and they're being forced into believing in things which are scams in the first place uh you 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 have to find in yourself that which delights in simple and effective practical actions and it goes on and on once you start because you then want to be a carpenter again you know yes. you'll then want to start fixing things, things and with... making beautiful objects yeah, yes. use your hands. Yeah. Use your hands, absolutely. So, Julian, it's been wonderful to talk to you uh, about all of this. Um, and can people go and find out more? I, I know you've got the hardwickestate.co.uk. They can find yes. out a, a bit of history on yes. uh, yourself and your pioneering work. And, uh, of course, get involved also in... Our, our website. I yes. for real ecology. I shall put the link UK. in the description. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people uh, yes. who are looking for practical uh, advice on the subjects we've been talking about just now, you will find a plethora of information these days on the internet. So yes. you've just got to do a bit of creative trolling. And you'll probably find something that suits you. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, Sir Julian Rose there. Um, and hopefully we will talk again uh, in a, maybe a, you know, a few months or a year's time and see what the progress has been made as people are beginning to turn their backs on the big globalists and actually get involved and use their hands again. So Julian, thank you so much.